Chapter 3 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The Ascent of Mount Tyndall. Morning dawned brightly upon our bivouac among a cluster of dark firs in the mountain corridor opened by an ancient glacier of King's River into the heart of the Sierras. It dawned a trifle sooner than we could have wished, but Professor Brewer and Hoffman had breakfasted before sunrise, and were off with barometer and theodolite upon their shoulders, purposing to ascend our amphitheater to its head and climb a great pyramidal peak which swelled up against the eastern sky, closing the view in that direction. We who remained in camp spent the day in overhauling campaign materials and preparing for a grand assault upon the summits. For a couple of hours we could decry our friends through the field glasses, their minute black forms moving slowly on among piles of giant debris, now and then lost, again coming into view, and at last disappearing altogether. It was twilight of evening and almost eight o'clock when they came back to camp, Brewer leading the way, Hoffman following, and as they sat down by our fire without uttering a word, we read upon their faces terrible fatigue. So we hastened to give them supper of coffee and soup, bread and venison, which resulted, after a time, in our getting in return the story of the day. For eight whole hours they had worked up over granite and snow, mounting ridge after ridge, till the summit was made about two o'clock. These snowy crests, bounding our view at the eastward, we had all along taken to be the summits of the Sierra, and Brewer had supposed himself to be climbing a dominant peak, from which he might look eastward over Owens Valley and out upon leagues of desert, instead of this vast wall of mountains, lifted still higher than his peak, rose beyond a tremendous canyon which lay like a trough between the two parallel ranks of peaks, Hoffman showed us on his sketchbook the profile of this new range, and I instantly recognized the peaks which I had seen from Mariposa, whose great white pile had led me to believe them the highest points of California. For a couple of months my friends had made me the target of plenty of pleasant banter about my highest land, which they lost faith in as we climbed from Thomas's mill, I too becoming a trifle anxious about it. But now that the truth had burst upon Brewer and Hoffman, they could not find words to describe the terribleness and grandeur of the deep canyon, nor for picturing those huge crags towering in line at the east. Their peak, as indicated by the barometer, was in the region of 13,400 feet, and a level across to the farther range showed its crest to be at least 1,500 feet higher. They had spent hours upon the summit scanning the eastern horizon and ranging downward into the labyrinth of gulfs below, had come at last with reluctance to the belief that to cross this gorge and ascend the eastern wall of peaks was utterly impossible. Brewer and Hoffman were old climbers, and their verdict of impossible oppressed me as I lay awake thinking of it, but early next morning I had made up my mind and taking Cotter aside, I asked him in an easy manner whether he would like to penetrate the terra incognita with me at the risk of our necks, provided Brewer should consent. In a frank, courageous tone, he answered after his usual mode, Why not? Stout of limb, stronger yet in heart, of iron endurance, and a quiet, unexcited temperament, and, better yet, deeply devoted to me, I felt that Cotter was the one comrade I would choose to face death with, for I believed there was in his manhood no room for fear or shirk. It was a trying moment for Brewer when we found him and volunteered to attempt a campaign for the top of California, because he felt a certain fatherly responsibility over our youth, a natural desire that we should not deposit our triturated remains in some undiscoverable hole among the feldspathic granites. But, like a true disciple of science, this was at last overbalanced by his intense desire to know more of the unexplored region. 
he freely confessed that he believed the plan madness and hoffman too told us we might as well attempt to get on a cloud as to try the peak as brewer gradually yielded his consent i saw by his conversation that there was a possibility of success so we spent the rest of the day in making preparations our walking shoes were in excellent condition the hobnails firm and new we laid out a barometer a compass a pocket level a set of wet and dry thermometers notebooks with bread cooked beans and venison enough to last a week rolled them all in blankets making two knapsack shaped packs strapped firmly together with loops for the arms which by brewer's estimate weighed forty pounds apiece gardner declared he would accompany us to the summit of the first range to look over into the gulf we were to cross and at last brewer and hoffman also concluded to go up with us quite too early for our profit we all betook ourselves to bed vainly hoping to get a long refreshing sleep from which we would arise ready for our tramp never a man welcomed those first gray streaks in the east gladder than i did unless it may be cotter who has in later years confessed that he did not go to sleep that night long before sunrise we had done our breakfast and were under way hoffman kindly bearing my pack and brewer cotter's our way led due east up the amphitheater and toward mount brewer as we had named the great pyramidal peak a while after leaving camp slant sunlight streamed in among gilded pinnacles along the slope of mount brewer touching here and there in broad dashes of yellow the gray walls which rose sweeping up on either hand like the sides of a ship our way along the valley's middle ascended over a number of huge steps rounded and abrupt at whose bases were pools of transparent snow water edged with rude piles of erratic glacier blocks scattered companies of alpine firs of red bark and having cypress-like darkness of foliage with fields of snow under sheltering cliffs and bits of softest velvet meadow clouded with minute white and blue flowers as we climbed the gorge grew narrow and sharp both sides wilder and the spurs which projected from them nearly overhanging the middle of the valley towered above us with more and more severe sculpture we frequently crossed deep fields of snow and at last reached the level of the highest pines where long slopes of debris swept down from either cliff meeting in the middle over and among these immense blocks often twenty and thirty feet high we were obliged to climb hearing far below us the subterranean gurgle of streams interlocking spurs nearly closed the gorge behind us our last view was out a granite gateway formed of two nearly vertical precipices sharp-edged jutting buttress-like and plunging down into a field of angular boulders which fill the valley bottom the eye ranged out from this open gateway overlooking the great king's canyon with its moraine terraced walls the domes of granite upon big meadows and the undulating stretch of forest which descends to the plain the gorge turning southward we rounded a sort of mountain promontory which closing the view behind us shut us up in the bottom of a perfect basin in front lay a placid lake reflecting the intense black blue of the sky granite stained with purple and red sank into it upon one side and a broad spotless field of snow came down to its margin upon the other from a pile of large granite blocks forty or fifty feet up above the lake margin we could look down fully a hundred feet through the transparent water to where boulders and pebbles were strewn upon the stone bottom we had now reached the base of mount brewer and were skirting its southern spurs in a wide open corridor surrounded in all directions by lofty granite crags from two to four thousand feet high above the limits of vegetation rocks 
lakes of deep heavenly blue and white trackless snows were grouped closely about us. Two sounds, a sharp little cry of Martin's, and occasional heavy crashes of falling rock, saluted us. Climbing became exceedingly difficult. Light air, for we had already reached 12,500 feet, beginning to tell upon our lungs to such an extent that my friend, who had taken turns with me in carrying my pack, was unable to do so any longer, and I adjusted it to my own shoulders for the rest of the day. After four hours of slow, laborious work, we made the base of the debris slope, which rose about a thousand feet to a saddle pass in the western mountain wall, that range upon which Mount Brewer is so prominent a point. We were nearly an hour in toiling up this slope over an uncertain footing which gave way at almost every step. At last, when almost at the top, we paused to take breath, and then all walked out upon the crest, laid off our packs, and sat down together upon the summit of the ridge, and for a few moments not a word was spoken. The Sierras are here two parallel summit ranges. We were upon the crest of the western ridge, and looked down into a gulf five thousand feet deep, sinking from our feet in abrupt cliffs nearly or quite two thousand feet, whose base plunged into a broad field of snow, lying steep and smooth for a great distance, but broken near its foot by craggy steps often a thousand feet high. Vague blue haze obscured the lost depths, hiding details, giving a bottomless distance out of which, like the breath of wind, floated up a faint tremble, vibrating upon the senses, yet never clearly heard. Rising on the other side, cliff above cliff, precipice piled upon precipice, rock over rock, up against sky, towered the most gigantic mountain wall in America, culminating in a noble pile of gothic-finished granite and enamel-like snow. How grand and inviting looked its white form, its untrodden, unknown crest, so high and pure in the clear, strong blue. I looked at it as one contemplating the purpose of his life, and for just one moment, I would have rather liked to dodge that purpose, or to have waited, or have found some excellent reason why I might not go. But all this quickly vanished, leaving a cheerful resolve to go ahead. From the two opposing mountain walls, singular, thin, knife-blade ridges of stone jetted out, dividing the sides of the gulf into a series of amphitheaters, each one a labyrinth of ice and rock. Piercing thick beds of snow sprang up knobs and straight isolated spires of rock, mere obelisks, curiously carved by frost, their rigid, slender forms casting a blue, sharp shadow upon the snow. Embosomed in depressions of ice, or resting on broken ledges, were azure lakes, deeper in tone than the sky, which at this altitude, even at midday, had a violet duskiness. To the south, not more than eight miles, a wall of peaks stood across the gulf, dividing the kings, which flowed north at our feet, from the Kern River that flowed down through the trough in the opposite direction. I did not wonder that Brewer and Hoffman pronounced our undertaking impossible, but when I looked at Cotter, there was such complete bravery in his eye that I asked him if he was ready to start. His old answer, why not, left the initiative with me. So I told Professor Brewer that we would bid him goodbye. Our friends helped us on with our packs in silence, and as we shook hands there was not a dry eye in the party. Before he let go of my hand, Professor Brewer asked me for my plan, and I had to own that I had but one which was to reach the highest peak in the range. After looking in every direction, I was obliged to confess that I saw as yet no practicable way. We bade them a good-bye, 
receiving their God bless you in return, and started southward along the range to look for some possible cliff to descend. Brewer, Gardner, and Hoffman turned north to push upward to the summit of Mount Brewer and complete their observations. We saw them whenever we halted, until at last, on the very summit, their microscopic forms were for the last time discernible. With very great difficulty we climbed a peak which surmounted our wall just to the south of the pass and, looking over the eastern brink, found that the precipice was still sheer and unbroken. In one place, where the snow lay against it to the very top, we went to its edge and contemplated a slide. About three thousand feet of unbroken white, at a fearfully steep angle, lay below us. We threw a stone over and watched it bound until it was lost in the distance. After fearful leaps, we could only detect it by the flashings of snow where it struck, and as these were, in some instances, three hundred feet apart, we decided not to launch our own valuable bodies, and the still more precious barometer after it. There seemed but one possible way to reach our goal. That was to make our way along the summit of the cross ridge which projected between the two ranges. This divide sprang out from our Mount Brewer wall, about four miles to the south of us. To reach it, we must climb up and down over the intended edge of the Mount Brewer wall. In attempting to do this, we had a rather lively time scaling a sharp granite needle, where we found our course completely stopped by precipices four and five hundred feet in height. Ahead of us, the summit continued to be broken into fantastic pinnacles, leaving us no hope of making our way along it. So we sought the most broken part of the eastern descent and began to climb down. The heavy knapsacks, besides wearing our shoulders gradually into a black and blue state, overbalanced us terribly and kept us in constant danger of pitching headlong. At last, taking them off, Cotter climbed down until he had found a resting place upon a cleft of rock, then I lowered them to him with our lasso, afterwards descending cautiously to his side, taking my turn in pioneering downward, receiving the freight of knapsacks by lasso as before. In this manner, we consumed more than half the afternoon in descending a thousand feet of broken, precipitous slope, and it was almost sunset when we found ourselves upon the fields of level snow which lay white and thick over the whole interior slope of the amphitheater. The gorge below us seemed utterly impassable. At our backs, the Mount Brewer wall either rose in sheer cliffs or in broken, rugged stairway, such as had offered us our descent. From this cruel dilemma, the cross divide furnished the only hope, and the sole chance of scaling that was at its junction with the Mount Brewer wall. Toward this point, we directed our course, marching wearily over stretches of dense frozen snow and regions of debris, reaching about sunset the last alcove of the amphitheater, just at the foot of the Mount Brewer wall. It was evidently impossible for us to attempt to climb it that evening, and we looked about the desolate recesses for a sheltered camping spot. A high granite wall surrounded us upon three sides, recurring to the southward in long elliptical curves. No part of the summit being less than 2,000 feet above us, the higher crags not unfrequently reaching 3,000 feet. A single field of snow swept around the base of the rock and covered the whole amphitheater except where a few spikes and rounded masses of granite rose through it and where two frozen lakes with their blue ice disks broke the monotonous surface through the white snow gate of our amphitheater as through a frame we looked eastward upon the summit group not a tree not a vestige of vegetation in sight. Sky, snow, and granite, the only elements in this wild picture. 
After searching for a shelter, we at last found a granite crevice near the margin of one of the frozen lakes, a sort of shelf just large enough for Cotter and me, where we hastened to make our bed. Having first filled the canteen from a small stream that trickled over the ice, knowing that in a few moments the rapid chill would freeze it, we ate our supper of cold venison and bread, and whittled from the sides of the wooden barometer case shavings enough to warm water for a cup of miserably tepid tea, and then, packing our provisions and instruments away at the head of the shelf, rolled ourselves in our blankets and lay down to enjoy the view. After such fatiguing exercises, the mind has an almost abnormal clearness. Whether this is wholly from within, or due to the intensely vitalizing mountain air, I'm not sure. Probably both contribute to the state of exaltation in which all alpine climbers find themselves. The solid granite gave me a luxurious repose, and I lay on the edge of our little rock niche and watched the strange yet brilliant scene. All the snow of our recess lay in the shadow of the high granite wall to the west, but the Kern Divide, which curved around us from the southeast, was in full light, its broken skyline, battlemented and adorned with innumerable rough-hewn spires and pinnacles, was a mass of glowing orange, intensely defined against the deep violet sky. At the open end of our horseshoe amphitheater, to the east, its floor of snow rounded over in a smooth brink, overhanging precipices which sank 2,000 feet into the King's Canyon. Across the gulf rose the whole procession of summit peaks, their lower halves rooted in a deep, somber shadow cast by the western wall, the heights bathed in a warm purple haze, in which the irregular marbling of snow burned with a pure crimson light. A few fleecy clouds, dyed fiery orange, drifted slowly eastward across the narrow zone of sky, which stretched from summit to summit like a roof. At times, the sound of waterfalls, faint and mingled with echoes, floated up through the still air. The snow nearby lay in cold, ghastly shade, warmed here and there in strange flashes by light reflected downward from drifting clouds. The somber waste about us, the deep violet vault overhead, those far summits glowing with reflected rose, the deep impenetrable gloom which filled the gorge and slowly and with vapor-like stealth climbed the mountain wall extinguishing the red light, all combined to produce an effect which may not be described, nor can I more than hint at the contrast between the brilliancy of the scene under full light and the cold, death-like repose which followed when the wan cliffs and pallid snow were all overshadowed with a ghostly gray. A sudden chill enveloped us. Stars in a moment crowded through the dark heaven, flashing with a frosty splendor. The snow congealed, the brooks ceased to flow, and under the powerful sudden leverage of frost immense blocks were dislodged all along the mountain summits and came thundering down the slopes booming upon the ice, dashing wildly upon rocks. Under the lee of our shelf we felt quite safe, but neither Cotter nor I would help being startled and jumping just a little, as these missiles, weighing often many tons, struck the ledge over our heads and whizzed down the gorge, their stroke resounding fainter and fainter, until at last only a confused echo reached us. The thermometer at nine o'clock marked twenty degrees above zero. We set the minimum and rolled ourselves together for the night. The longer I lay, the less I liked that shelf of granite. It grew hard in time, and cold also, my bones seeming to approach actual contact with the chilled rock. Moreover, I found that even so vigorous a circulation as mine was not enough to warm up the ledge to anything like a comfortable temperature. A single thickness of blanket is a better mattress than none, 
but the larger crystals of orthoclase protruding plentifully punched my back and caused me to revolve on a horizontal axis with precision and frequency. Oh, how I loved Cotter! How I hugged him and got warm, while our backs gradually petrified, till we whirled over and thawed them out together. The slant of that bed was diagonal and excessive. Down it we slid till the ice chilled us awake, and we crawled back and chalked ourselves up with bits of granite inserted under my ribs and shoulders. In this pleasant position we got dozing again, and there stole over me a most comfortable ease. The granite softened perceptibly. I was delightfully warm and sank into an industrious slumber, which lasted with great soundness till four, when we rose and ate our breakfast of frozen venison. The thermometer stood at two above zero. Everything was frozen tight except the canteen, which we had prudently kept between us all night. Stars still blazed brightly, and the moon, hidden from us by western cliffs, shone in pale reflection upon the rocky heights to the east, which rose dimly white up from the impenetrable shadows of the canyon. Silence! cold, ghastly dimness in which loomed huge forms, the biting frostiness of the air, wrought upon our feelings as we shouldered our packs and started with slow pace to climb toward the divide. Soon to our dismay, we found the straps had so chafed our shoulders that the weight gave us great pain and obliged us to pad them with their handkerchiefs and extra socks, which remedy did not wholly relieve us from the constant wearing pain of the heavy load. Directing our steps southward towards a niche in the wall, which bounded us only half a mile distant, we traveled over a continuous snow field frozen so densely as scarcely to yield at all to our tread, at the same time compressing enough to make that crisp, frosty sound which we all used to enjoy even before we knew from the books that it had something to do with the severe name of regelation. As we advanced, the snow sloped more and more steeply up toward the crags, till by and by it became quite dangerous, causing us to cut steps with Cotter's large bowie knife, a slow, tedious operation requiring patience of a pretty permanent kind. In this way, we spent a quiet social hour or so. The sun had not yet reached us, being shut out by the high amphitheater wall, but its cheerful light reflected downward from a number of higher crags, filling the recess with the brightness of day and putting out of existence those shadows which so somberly darkened the earlier hours. To look back when we stopped to rest was to realize our danger, that smooth, swift slope of ice carrying the eye down a thousand feet to the margin of a frozen mirror of ice, ribs and needles of rock piercing up through the snow, so closely grouped that, had we fallen, a miracle only might save us from being dashed. This led to rather deeper steps and greater care, that our burdens should be held more nearly over the center of gravity, and a pleasant relief when we got to the top of the snow, and sat down on a block of granite to breathe, and look up in search of a way up the thousand-foot cliff of broken surface, among the lines of fracture and the galleries winding along the face. It would have disheartened us to gaze up the hard, sheer front of precipices, and search among splintered projections, crevices, shelves, and snow patches for an inviting route, had we not been animated by a faith that the mountains could not defy us. Choosing what looked like the least impossible way, we started, but finding it unsafe to work with packs on, resumed the yesterday's plan, Cotter taking the lead, climbing about fifty feet ahead, and hoisting up the knapsacks and barometer as I tied them to the end of the lasso. Constantly closing up in hopeless difficulty before us, 
the way opened again and again to our gymnastics till we stood together upon a mere shelf not more than two feet wide which led diagonally up the smooth cliff edging along in careful steps our backs flattened upon the granite we moved slowly to a broad platform where we stopped for breath there was no foothold above us looking down over the course we had come it seemed and i really believe it was an impossible descent for one can climb upward with safety where he cannot downward to turn back was to give up in defeat and we sat at least half an hour suggesting all possible routes to the summit excepting none and feeling disheartened about thirty feet directly over our heads was another shelf which if we could reach seemed to offer at least a temporary way upward on its edge were two or three spikes of granite whether firmly connected with the cliff or merely blocks of debris we could not tell from below i said to cotter i thought of but one possible plan it was to lasso one of these blocks and to climb sailor fashion hand over hand up the rope in the lasso i had perfect confidence for i had seen more than one spanish bull throw his whole weight against it without parting a strand the shelf was so narrow that throwing the coil of rope was a very difficult undertaking i tried three times and cotter spent five minutes vainly whirling the loop up at the granite spikes at last i made a lucky throw and it tightened upon one of the smaller protuberances i drew the noose close and very gradually threw my hundred and fifty pounds upon the rope then cotter joined me and for a moment we both hung our united weight upon it whether the rock moved slightly or whether the lasso stretched a little we were unable to decide but the trial must be made and i began to climb slowly the smooth precipice face against which my body swung offered no foothold and the whole climb had therefore to be done by the arms an effort requiring all one's determination when about halfway up i was obliged to rest and curling my feet in the rope managed to relieve my arms for a moment in this position i could not resist the fascinating temptation of a a survey downward straight down nearly a thousand feet below at the foot of the rocks began the snow whose steep roof-like slope exaggerated into almost vertical angle curved down in a long white field broken far away by rocks and polished round lakes of ice cotter looked up cheerfully and asked how i was making it to which i answered that i had plenty of wind left at that moment when hanging between heaven and earth it was a deep satisfaction to look down at the wide gulf of desolation beneath and up to unknown dangers ahead and feel my nerves cool and unshaken a few poles hand over hand brought me to the edge of the shelf when throwing an arm around the granite spike i swung my body upon the shelf and lay down to rest shouting to cotter that i was all right and that the prospects upward were capital after a few moments breathing i looked over the brink and directed my comrade to tie the barometer to the lower end of the lasso which he did and that precious instrument was hoisted to my station and the lasso sent down twice for knapsacks after which cotter came up the rope in his very muscular way without once stopping to rest we took our loads in our hands swinging the barometer over my shoulder and climbed up a shelf which led in a zigzag direction upward into the south bringing us out at last upon the thin blade of a ridge which connected a short distance above with the summit it was formed of huge blocks shattered and ready at a touch to fall so narrow and sharp was the upper slope that we dared not walk but got astride and worked slowly along with our hands pushing the knapsacks in advance 
now and then holding our breath when loose masses rocked under our weight. Once upon this summit, a grand view burst upon us. Hastening to step upon the crest of the divide, which was never more than ten feet wide, frequently sharpened to a mere blade, and we looked down the other side and were astonished to find we had ascended the gentler slope, and that the rocks fell from our feet in almost vertical precipices for a thousand feet or more. A glance along the summit toward the highest group showed us that any advance in that direction was impossible, for the thin ridge was gashed down in notches three or four hundred feet deep, forming a procession of pillars, obelisks, and blocks piled upon each other and looking terribly insecure. We then deposited our knapsacks in a safe place and, finding that it was already noon, determined to rest a little while and take a lunch at over 13,000 feet above the sea. West of us stretched the Mount Brewer Wall, with its succession of smooth precipices and amphitheater ridges. To the north, the great gorge of the King's River yawned down 5,000 feet. To the south, the Valley of the Kern, opening in the opposite direction, was broader, less deep, but more filled with broken masses of granite. Clustered about the foot of the divide were a dozen alpine lakes, the higher ones blue sheets of ice, the lowest completely melted. Still lower in the depths of the two canyons, we could see groups of forest trees, but they were so dim and so distant as never to relieve the prevalent mass of rock and snow. Our divide cast its shadow for a mile down King's Canyon, a dark blue profile upon the broad sheets of sunny snow, from whose brightness the hard, splintered cliffs caught reflections and wore an aspect of joy. Thousands of rills poured from the melting snow, filling the air with a musical tinkle as of many accordant bells. The Kern Valley opened below us with its smooth oval outline, the work of extinct glaciers, whose form and extent were evident from worn cliff surface and rounded wall. Snowfields, relics of the former Neve, hung in white tapestries around its ancient birthplace, and, as far as we could see, the broad corrugated valley, for a breadth of fully ten miles shone with burnishings, wherever its granite surface was not covered with lakelets or thickets of alpine vegetation. Through a deep cut in the Mount Brewer wall, we gained our first view to the westward, and saw in the distance the wall of the South King's Canyon, and the granite point which Cotter and I had climbed a fortnight before. But for the haze we might have seen the plain, for above its farther limit were several points of the coast ranges, isolated like islands in the sea. The view was so grand, the mountain colors so brilliant, immense snow fields and blue alpine lakes so charming, that we almost forgot we were ever to move, and it was only after a swift hour of this delight that we began to consider our future course. The King's Canyon, which headed against our wall, seemed untraversable, no human being could climb along the divide. We had then but one hope of reaching the peak, and our greatest difficulty lay at the start. If we could climb down to the Kern side of the divide, and succeed in reaching the base of the precipices which fell from our feet, it really looked as if we might travel without difficulty among the roche Moutonne to the other side of the Kern Valley and make our attempt upon the southward flank of the great peak. One look at the sublime white giant decided us. We looked down over the precipice, and at first could see no method of descent. Then we went back and looked at the road we had come up to see if that were not possibly as bad. But the broken surface of the rocks was evidently much better climbing ground than anything ahead of us. Cotter, with danger, edged his way along the wall to the east and I to the west to see if there might not be some favorable point, but we both returned with the belief that the precipice in front of us was as passable as any of it. Down it we must. 
After lying on our faces, looking over the brink, ten or twenty minutes, I suggested that by lowering ourselves on the rope we might climb from crevice to crevice, but we saw no shelf large enough for ourselves and the knapsacks, too. However, we were not going to give it up without a trial, and I made the rope fast around my breast and, looping the noose over a firm point of rock, let myself slide gradually down to a notch forty feet below. There was only room beside me for Cotter, so I made him send down the knapsacks first. I then tied these together by the straps with my silk handkerchiefs and hung them off as far to the left as I could reach without losing my balance, looping the handkerchiefs over a point of rock. Cotter then slid down the rope, and with considerable difficulty, we whipped the noose off its resting place above and cut off our connection with the upper world. "'We're in it for it now, King,' remarked my comrade as he looked aloft and then down. But our blood was up, and danger added only an exhilarating thrill to the nerves. The shelf was hardly more than two feet wide, and the granite so smooth that we could find no place to fasten the lasso for the next descent. So I determined to try the climb with only as little aid as possible. Tying it round my breast again, I gave the other end into Cotter's hands, and he, bracing his back against the cliff, found for himself as firm a foothold as he could and promised to give me all the help in his power. I made up my mind to bear no weight unless it was absolutely necessary, and for the first ten feet I found cracks and protuberances enough to support me, making every square inch of surface do friction duty, and hugging myself against the rocks as tightly as I could. When within about eight feet of the next shelf, I twisted myself round upon the face, hanging by two rough blocks of protruding feldspar, and looked vainly for some further handhold. But the rock, beside being perfectly smooth, overhung slightly, and my legs dangled in the air. I saw that the next cleft was over three feet broad, and I thought, possibly, I might, by a quick slide, reach it in safety without dangering Cotter. I shouted to him to be very careful, and let go in case I fell loosened my hold upon the rope, and slid quickly down. My shoulder struck against the rock and threw me out of balance. For an instant I reeled over upon the verge in danger of falling, but in the excitement I thrust out my hand and seized a small alpine gooseberry bush, the first piece of vegetation we had seen. Its roots were so firmly fixed in the crevice that it held my weight and saved me. I could no longer see Cotter, but I talked to him and heard the two knapsacks come bumping along until they slid over the eaves above me and swung down to my station, when I seized the lasso's end and braced myself as well as possible, intending, if he slipped, to haul in slack and help him as best I might. And he came slowly down from crack to crack. I heard his hobnailed shoes grating on the granite Presently there appeared, dangling from the eaves above my head. I had gathered in the rope until it was taut, and then hurriedly told him to drop. He hesitated a moment and let go. Before he struck the rock, I had him by the shoulder and whirled him down upon his side, thus preventing his rolling overboard, which friendly action he took quite coolly. The third descent was not a difficult one, nor the fourth, but when we had climbed down about 250 feet, the rocks were so glacially polished and water-worn that it seemed impossible to get any farther. To our right was a crack penetrating the rock perhaps a foot deep, widening at the surface to three or four inches, which proved to be the only possible ladder. As the chances seemed rather desperate, we concluded to tie ourselves together in order to share a common fate and with the slack of thirty feet between us and our knapsacks on our backs, we climbed into the crevice and began descending with our faces to the cliff. This had to be done with unusual caution, for the foothold was about as good as none, 
and our fingers slipped annoyingly on the smooth stone. Besides, the knapsacks and instruments kept a steady backward pull tending to overbalance us. But we took pains to descend one at a time and rest whenever the niches gave our feet a safe support. In this way we got down about eighty feet of smooth, nearly vertical wall, reaching the top of a rude granite stairway which led to the snow. And here we sat down to rest and found to our astonishment that we had been three hours from the summit. After breathing a half minute, we continued down, jumping from rock to rock, and having by practice become very expert in balancing ourselves, sprang on, never resting long enough to lose the aplomb, and in this manner made a quick descent over rugged debris to the crest of a snowfield, which for seven or eight hundred feet more swept down in a smooth, even slope, a very high angle, to the borders of a frozen lake. Without untying the lasso which bound us together, we sprang upon the snow with a shout, and glissaded down splendidly, turning now and then a somersault, and shooting out like cannonballs almost to the middle of the frozen lake, I upon my back, and caught her feet first in a swimming position. The ice cracked in all directions. It was only a thin, transparent film, through which we could see deep into the lake. Untying ourselves, we hurried ashore in different directions, lest our combined weight should be too great a strain upon any point. With curiosity and wonder, we scanned every shelf and niche of the last descent. It seemed quite impossible we could have come down there, and now it actually was beyond human power to get back again. But what cared we? Sufficient unto the day. We were bound for that still distant, though gradually nearing, summit, and we had come from a cold, shadowed cliff into deliciously warm sunshine, and were jolly, shouting, singing songs, and calling out the companionship of a hundred echoes. Six miles away, with no grave danger, no great difficulty between us, lay the base of our grand mountain. Upon its skirts we saw a little grove of pines, an ideal bivouac and toward this we bent our course. After the continued climbing of the day, walking was a delicious rest, and forward we pressed with considerable speed, our hobnails giving us firm footing on the glittering glacial surface. Every fluting of the great valley was in itself a considerable canyon, into which we descended, climbing down the scored rocks, and swinging from block to block until we reached the level of the pines. Here, sheltered among roche moutonnets, began to appear little fields of alpine grass, pale yet sunny, soft under our feet, fragrantly jeweled with flowers of fairy delicacy, holding up amid thickly clustered blades, chalices of turquoise and amethyst white stars, and fiery little globes of red. Lakelets, small but innumerable, were held in glacial basins, the striae and grooves of that old dragon's track ornamenting their smooth bottoms. One of these, a sheet of pure barrel hue, gave us much pleasure from its lovely transparency, and because we lay down in the necklace of grass about it and smelled flowers, while tired muscles relaxed upon warm beds of verdure, the pain in our burdened shoulders went away, leaving us delightfully comfortable. After the stern grandeur of granite and ice, and with its peaks and walls still in view, it was relief to find ourselves again in the region of life. I never felt for trees and flowers such a sense of intimate relationship and sympathy. When we had no longer excuse for resting, I invented the palpable subterfuge of measuring the altitude of the spot, since the few clumps of low, wide-bowed pines nearby were the highest living trees. So we lay longer, with less and less will to rise. And when resolution called us to our feet, the getting up was sorely like Rip Van Winkle's in the third act. The deep glacial canyon flutings across which our march then lay 
proved to be great consumers of time. Indeed, it was sunset when we reached the eastern ascent and began to toil up through the scattered pines and over trains of moraine rocks toward the great peak. Stars were already flashing brilliantly in the sky, and the low glowing arch in the west had almost vanished when we reached the upper trees and threw down our knapsacks to camp. The forest grew on a sort of plateau shelf with a precipitous front to the west, a level surface which stretched eastward and back to the foot of our mountain, whose lower spurs already reached within a mile of camp. Within the shelter lay a huge fallen log, like all these alpine woods, one mass of resin, which flared up when we applied a match, illuminating the whole grove. By contrast with the darkness outside, we seemed to be in a vast, many-pillared hall. The stream close by afforded water for our blessed teapot, venison frizzled with mild appetizing sound upon the ends of pine sticks, Matchless beans allowed themselves to become seductively crisp upon our tin plates. That supper seemed to me, then, the quintessence of gastronomy, and I am sure Cotter and I must have said some very good après dîner things, though I long ago forgot them all. Within the ring of warmth, on elastic beds of pine needles, we curled up and fell swiftly into a sound sleep. I woke up once in the night to look at my watch and observed that the sky was overcast with a thin film of cirrus cloud to which the reflected moonlight lent the appearance of a glimmering tint stretched from mountain to mountain over canyons filled with impenetrable darkness, only the vaguely lighted peaks and white snow fields distinctly seen. I closed my eyes and slept soundly until Cotter woke me at half-past three. When we arose, breakfasted by the light of our fire, which still blazed brilliantly, and, leaving our knapsacks, started for the mountain with only instruments, canteens, and luncheon. In the indistinct moonlight, climbing was very difficult at first, for we had to thread our way along a plain which was literally covered with glacier boulders, and the innumerable brooks which we crossed were frozen solid. However, our march brought us to the base of the great mountain, which, rising high against the east, shut out the coming daylight and kept us in profound shadow. From base to summit rose a series of broken crags, lifting themselves from a general slope of debris. Toward the left, the angle seemed to be rather gentler, and the surface less ragged, and we hoped, by a long detour around the base, to make an easy climb up this gentler face. So we toiled on for an hour over the rocks, reaching at last the bottom of the north slope. Here our work began in earnest. The blocks were of enormous size, and in every stage of unstable equilibrium, frequently rolling over as we jumped upon them, making it necessary for us to take a second leap and land where we best could. To our relief, we soon surmounted the largest blocks, reaching a smaller size, which served us as a sort of stairway. The advancing daylight revealed to us a very long, comparatively even snow slope, whose surface was pierced by many knobs and granite heads, giving it the aspect of an ice roofing, fastened on with bolts of stone. It stretched in far perspective to the summit, where already the rose of sunrise reflected gloriously, kindling a fresh enthusiasm within us. Immense boulders were partly embedded in the ice just above us, whose constant melting left them trembling on the edge of a fall. It communicated no very pleasant sensation to see above you these immense missiles hanging by a mere band, and knowing that, as soon as the sun rose, you would be exposed to a constant cannonade. The east side of the peak, which we could now partially see, was too precipitous to think of climbing. The slope toward our camp was too much broken into pinnacles and crags to offer us any hope, 
or to divert us from the single way, dead ahead, up slopes of ice and among fragments of granite. The sun rose upon us while we were climbing the lower part of this snow, and in less than half an hour, melting, began to liberate huge blocks which thundered down past us, gathering and growing into small avalanches below. We did not dare climb one above another, according to our ordinary mode, but kept about an equal level, a hundred feet apart, lest dislodging the blocks, one should hurl them down upon the other. We climbed alternately up smooth faces of granite, clinging simply by the cracks and protruding crystals of feldspar, and then hewed steps up fearfully steep slopes of ice, zigzagging to the right and left to avoid the flying boulders. When midway up the slope, we reached a place where the granite rose in perfectly smooth bluffs on either side of a gorge, a narrow cut or walled way leading up to the flat summit of the cliff. This we scaled by cutting ice steps, only to find ourselves fronted again by a still higher wall. Ice sloped from its front at too steep an angle for us to follow, but had melted in contact with it, leaving a space three feet wide between the ice and the rock. We entered this crevice and climbed along its bottom, with the wall of rock rising a hundred feet above us on one side, and a thirty-foot face of ice on the other, through which light of an intense cobalt blue penetrated. Reaching the upper end, we had to cut our footsteps upon the ice again, and, having braced our backs against the granite, climb up to the surface. We were now in a dangerous position. To fall into the crevice upon one side was to be wedged to death between rock and ice. To make a slip was to be shot down five hundred feet and then hurled over the brink of a precipice. In the friendly seat which this wedge gave me, I stopped to take wet and dry observations with the thermometer, this being an absolute preventive of a scare, and to enjoy the view. The wall of our mountain sank abruptly to the left, opening for the first time an outlook to the eastward. Deep, it seemed almost vertically, beneath us, we could see the blue water of Owens Lake, ten thousand feet down. The summit peaks to the north were piled in titanic confusion, their ridges overhanging the eastern slope with terrible abruptness. Clustered upon the shelves, in plateaus below, were several frozen lakes, and in all directions swept magnificent fields of snow. The summit was now not over five hundred feet distant, and we started on again with the exhilarating hope of success. But if nature had intended to secure the summit from all assailants, she could not have planned her defenses better. For the smooth granite wall, which rose above the snow slope, continued, apparently, quite round the peak, and we looked in great anxiety to see if there was not one place where it might be climbed. It was all blank except in one place. Quite near us, the snow bridged across the crevice, and rose in a long point to the summit of the wall, a great icicle column frozen in a niche of the bluff, its base about ten feet wide, narrowing to two feet at the top. We climbed to the base of the spire of ice, and with the utmost care began to cut our stairway. The material was an exceedingly compacted snow, passing into clear ice as it neared the rock. We climbed the first half of it with comparative ease. After that, it was almost vertical and so thin that we did not dare to cut the footsteps deep enough to make them absolutely safe. There was a constant dread lest our ladder should break off and we be thrown either down the snow slope or into the bottom of the crevasse. At last, in order to prevent myself from falling over backwards, I was obliged to thrust my hand into the crack between the ice and the wall, and the spire became so narrow that I could do this on both sides, so 
that the climb was made is upon a tree, cutting mere toe holes in embracing the whole column of ice in my arms. At last I reached the top, and with the greatest caution wormed my body over the brink and rolling out upon the smooth surface of the granite, looked over and watched Cotter make his climb. He came steadily up, with no sense of nervousness, until he got to the narrow part of the ice, and here he stopped and looked up with a forlorn face to me. But as he climbed up over the edge, the broad smile came back to his face, and he asked me if it had occurred to me that we had, by and by, to go down again. We now had an easy slope to the summit, and hurried up over rocks and ice, reaching the crest at exactly twelve o'clock. I rang my hammer upon the topmost rock. We grasped hands, and I reverently named the Grand Peak Mount Tyndall. End of Chapter 3 The Ascent of Mount Tyndall Chapter 4 of Mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada by Clarence King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 The Descent of Mount Tyndall. To our surprise, upon sweeping the horizon with my level, there appeared two peaks equal in height with us, and two rising even higher. That which looked highest of all was a cleanly cut helmet of granite upon the same ridge with Mount Tyndall, lying about six miles south, and fronting the desert with a bold square of bluff which rises to the crest of the peak, where a white fold of snow trims it gracefully. Mount Whitney, as we afterwards called it in honor of our chief, is probably the highest land within the United States. Its summit looked glorious, but inaccessible. The general topography overlooked by us may be thus simply outlined. Two parallel chains, enclosing an intermediate trough, face each other. Across this deep, enclosed gulf from wall to wall juts the thin but lofty and craggy ridge or divide before described, which forms an important watershed, sending those streams which enter the chasm north of it into Kings River those south forming the most important sources of the Kern, whose straight, rapidly deepening valley stretches south, carved profoundly in granite, while the kings, after flowing longitudinally in the opposite course for eight or ten miles, turns abruptly west around the base of Mount Brewer, cuts across the western ridge, opening a gate of its own, and carves a rock channel transversely down the Sierra to the California Plain. Fronting us stood the West Chain, a great mural ridge watched over by two dominant heights, Cahuilla Peak and Mount Brewer, its wonderful profile defining against the western sky a multitude of peaks and spires. Bold buttresses jut out through the fields of ice and reach down stone arms among snow and debris. North and south of us, the higher, or eastern, summit stretched on in miles and miles of snow peaks, the farthest horizon still crowded with their white points. East, the whole range fell in sharp, hurrying abruptness to the desert, where, 10,000 feet below, lay a vast expanse of arid plain intersected by low parallel ranges traced from north to south. Upon the one side, a thousand sculptures of stone, hard, sharp, shattered by cold into infinite fractures and rift, springing up mutely severe into the dark, austere blue of heaven, scarred and marked, except where snow or ice, spiked down by ragged granite bolts, shields its pale armor these rough mountain shoulders, storm tinted at the summit, and dark where, swooping down from ragged cliff, the rocks plunge over canyon walls into blue, silent gulfs. Upon the other hand, reaching out to horizons faint and remote, 
lay plains clouded with the ashen hues of death, stark, wind-swept floors of white, and hill ranges, rigidly formal, monotonously low, all lying under an unfeeling brilliance of light, which for all its strange unclouded clearness has yet a vague half-darkness, a suggestion of black and shade more truly pathetic than fading twilight. No greenness soothes, no shadow cools the glare. Owen's lake, an oval of acrid water, lies dense blue upon the brown sage plain, looking like a plate of hot metal. Traced in an ancient beach lines, here and there upon hill and plain, relics of ancient lake shore outline the memory of a cooler past, a period of life and verdure where the stony chains were green islands among basins of wide, watery expanse. The two halves of this view, both in sight at once, express the highest, most acute aspects of desolation, inanimate forms out of which something living has gone forever. From the desert have dried up and blown away its seas. Their shores and white, salt-strewn bottoms lie there in the eloquence of death. Sharp white light glances from all the mountain walls, where in marks and polishings has been written the epitaph of glaciers now melted and vanished into air. Vacant canyons lie open to the sun, bare, treeless, half shrouded with snow, cumbered with loads of broken debris still as graves, except when flights of rocks rush down some chasm's throat, startling the mountains with harsh, dry rattle, their fainter echoes from below followed too quickly by dense silence. The serene sky is grave with nocturnal darkness. The earth blinds you with its light. That fair contrast we love in lower lands between bright heavens and dark, cool earth here reverses itself with terrible energy. You look up into an infinite vault, unveiled by clouds, empty and dark, from which no brightness seems to ray, an expanse with no graded perspective, no tremble, no vapory mobility, only the vast yawning of hollow space. With an aspect of endless remoteness burns the small white sun, yet its light seems to pass invisibly through the sky, blazing out with intensity upon mountain and plain, flooding rock details with painfully bright reflections, and lighting up the burnt sand and stone of the desert with a strange, blinding glare. There is no sentiment of beauty in the whole scene, no suggestion, however far remote, of sheltered landscape, not even the air of virgin hospitality that greets us explorers in so many uninhabited spots, which by their fertility and loveliness of grove or meadow seem to offer man a home or us nomads a pleasant campground. Silence and desolation are the themes which nature has wrought out under this eternally serious sky. A faint suggestion of life clings about the middle altitudes of the eastern slope, where black companies of pine, stunted from breathing the hot desert air, group themselves just beneath the bottom of perpetual snow or grow in patches of cloudy darkness over the moraines, those piles of wreck crowded from their pathway by glaciers long dead. Something there is pathetic in the very emptiness of these old glacier valleys, these imperishable tracks of unseen engines. One's eye ranges up their broad, open channel to the shrunken white fields surrounding hollow amphitheaters, which were once crowded with deep burdens of snow, the birthplace of rivers of ice now wholly melted, the dry, clear heavens overhead, blank of any promise of ever rebuilding them. I have never seen nature when she seemed so little mother nature as in this place of rocks and snow, echoes and emptiness. It impresses me as the ruins of some bygone geological period, and no part of the present order, like a specimen of chaos, 
which has defied the finishing hand of time. Of course, I see its bearings upon climate, and could read a lesson quite glibly as to its usefulness as a condenser, and tell you gravely how much California has for which she may thank these heights, and how little Nevada. But looking from this summit with all desire to see everything, the one overmastering feeling is desolation. Desolation. Next to this, and more pleasing to notice, is the interest and richness of the granite forms. For the whole region, from plain to plain, is built of this dense solid rock and is sculptured under chisel of cold and shapes of great variety, yet all having a common spirit, which is purely Gothic. In the much discussed origin of this order of building, I never remember to have seen, though it can hardly have escaped mention, any suggestion of the possibility of the Gothic having been inspired by granite forms. Yet, as I sat on Mount Tyndall, the whole mountains shaped themselves like the ruins of cathedrals, sharp roof ridges, pinnacled and statued, buttresses more spired and ornamented than Milan's, receding doorways with pointed arches carved into blank facades of granite, doors never to be opened, innumerable jutting points with here and there a single cruciform peak, its frozen roof and granite spires so strikingly gothic I cannot doubt that the Alps furnished the models for early cathedrals of that order. I thoroughly enjoyed the silence, which, gratefully contrasting with the surrounding tumult of form, conveyed to me a new sentiment. I have lain and listened through the heavy calm of a tropical voyage, hour after hour, longing for a sound. And in desert nights, the dead stillness has many a time awakened me from sleep. For moments, too, in my forest life, the groves made absolutely no breath of movement. But there is around these summits the soundlessness of a vacuum. The sea stillness is that of sleep. The desert of death, the silence, is like the waveless calm of space. All the while I made my instrumental observations, the fascination of the view so held me that I felt no surprise at seeing water boiling over our little faggot blaze at a temperature of 192 degrees Fahrenheit, nor in observing the barometrical column stand at 17.99 inches. And it was not till a week or so after that I realized we had felt none of the conventions of nausea, headache, and I don't know what all, that people are supposed to suffer at extreme altitudes. But these things go with guides and porters, I believe, and with coming down to one's hotel at evening there to scold one's picturesque aubergiste in a French, which strikes upon his ear as a foreign tongue, possibly all that will come to us with advancing time, and what is known as doing America. They are already shooting our buffaloes, it cannot be long before they will cause themselves to be honorably dragged up and down our sierras with perennial yellow gator and ostentation of bathtub. Having completed our observations, we packed up the instruments, glanced once again around the whole field of view, and descended to the top of our icicle ladder. Upon looking over, I saw to my consternation that during the day, the upper half had broken off. Scars traced down upon the snowfield below it indicated the manner of its fall, and far below, upon the shattered debris, were strewn its white relics. I saw that nothing but the sudden gift of wings could possibly take us down to the snow ridge. We held counsel and concluded to climb quite round the peak in search of the best mode of descent. As we crept about the east face, we could look straight down upon Owens Valley and into the vast glacier gorges and over piles of moraines and fluted rocks and the frozen lakes of the eastern slope. When we reached the southwest front of the mountain, we found that its general form was that of an immense horseshoe, 
the great eastern ridge forming one side, and the spur, which we descended to our camp, the other, we having climbed up the outer part of the toe. Within the curve of the horseshoe was a gorge, cut almost perpendicularly down 2,000 feet, its side rough-hewn walls of rocks and snow, its narrow bottom almost a continuous chain of deep blue lakes with loads of ice and debris piles. The stream which flowed through them joined the waters from our home grove a couple of miles below the camp. If we could reach the level of the lakes, I believed we might easily climb round them and out of the upper end of the horseshoe and walk upon the Kern Plateau round to our bivouac. It required a couple of hours of very painstaking, deliberate climbing to get down the first descent, which we did, however, without hurting our barometer and fortunately without the fatiguing use of the lasso, reaching finally the uppermost lake, a granite bowl full of cobalt blue water, transparent and unrippled. So high and enclosing were the tall walls about us, so narrow and shut in the canyon, so flattened seemed the cover of sky, we felt oppressed after the expanse and freedom of our hours on the summit. The snow field we followed, descending farther, was irregularly honeycombed in deep pits, circular or irregular in form, and melted to a greater or less depth, holding each a large stone embedded in the bottom. It seems they must have fallen from the overhanging heights with sufficient force to plunge into the snow. Brilliant light and strong color met our eyes at every glance, the rocks of a deep purple-red tint, the pure alpine lakes of a cheerful sapphire blue, the snow glitteringly white. The walls on either side, for half of their height, were planed and polished by glaciers, and from the smoothly glazed sides the sun was reflected as from a mirror. Mile after mile we walked cautiously over the snow and climbed around the margins of lakes and over piles of debris which marked the ancient terminal moraines. At length we reached the end of the horseshoe, where the walls contracted to a gateway, rising on either side in immense vertical pillars a thousand feet high. Through this gateway, we could look down the valley of the Kern, and beyond, to the gentler ridges, where a smooth growth of forest darkened the rolling plateau. Passing the last snow, we walked through this gateway and turned westward round the spur toward our camp. The three miles which closed our walk were alternately through groves of Pinus flexilis and upon plains of granite. The glacier sculpture and planing are here very beautiful, the large crystals of orthoclase with which the granite is studded being cut down to the common level, their rosy tint making with the white base a beautiful burnished porphyry. The sun was still an hour high when we reached camp, and with a feeling of relaxation and repose we threw ourselves down to rest by the log, which had still continued blazing. We had accomplished our purpose. During the last hour or two of our tramp, Cotter had complained of his shoes, which were rapidly going to pieces. Upon examination, we found to our dismay that there was not over half a day's wear left in them, a calamity which gave to our difficult homeward climb a new element of danger. The last nail had been worn from my own shoes, and the soles were scratched to the quick, but I believed them stout enough to hold together till we should reach the main camp. We planned a pair of moccasins for Cotter, and then spent a pleasant evening by the campfire, rehearsing our climb to the detail, sleep finally overtaking us and holding us fast bound until broad daylight the next morning, when we woke up with a sense of having slept for a week, quite bright and perfectly refreshed for our homeward journey. After a frugal breakfast, in which we limited ourselves to a few cubic inches of venison and a couple of stingy slices of bread, with a single meager cup of diluted tea, we shouldered our knapsacks, which now sat lightly upon our toughened shoulders, 
and marched out upon the granite plateau. We had concluded that it was impossible to retrace our former way, knowing well that the precipitous divide could not be climbed from this side. Then, too, we had gained such confidence in our climbing powers from constant victory that we concluded to attempt the passage of the great King's Canyon, mainly because this was the only mode of reaching camp, and since the geological section of the granite it exposed would afford us an exceedingly instructive study. The broad granite plateau, which forms the upper region of the Kern Valley, slopes in general inclination up to the Great Divide. This remarkably pinnacled ridge where it approaches the Mount Tyndall Wall, breaks down into a broad depression where the Kern Valley sweeps northward until it suddenly breaks off in precipices 3,000 feet down into the King's Canyon. The morning was wholly consumed in walking up this gently inclined plain of granite, our way leading over the glacier-polished foldings and along graded undulations among labyrinths of alpine garden in wildernesses of erratic boulders, little lake basins, and scattered clusters of dwarfed and somber pine. About noon, we suddenly came upon the brink of a precipice which sunk sharply from our feet into the gulf of the King's Canyon. Directly opposite us rose Mount Brewer, and up out of the depths of those vast sheets of frozen snow swept spiry buttress ridges dividing the upper heights into those amphitheaters over which we had struggled on our outward journey. Straight across from our point of view was the chamber of rock and ice where we had camped on the first night. The wall at our feet fell sharp and rugged, its lower two-thirds hidden from our view by the projections of a thousand feet of crags. Here and there, as we looked down, small patches of ice held in rough hollows rested upon the steep surface, but it was too abrupt for any great fields of snow. I dislodged a boulder upon the edge and watched it bound down the rocky precipice, dash over eaves a thousand feet below us, and disappear. The crash of its fall coming up to us from the unseen depths fainter and fainter until the air only trembled with confused echoes. A long look at the pass to the south of Mount Brewer, where we had parted from our friends, animated us with courage to begin the descent, which we did with utmost care, for the rocks, becoming more and more glacier-smoothed, afforded us hardly any firm footholds. When down about 800 feet, we again rolled rocks ahead of us, and saw them disappear over the eaves, and only heard the sound of their stroke after many seconds which convinced us that directly below lay a great precipice. At this juncture, the soles came entirely off Cotter's shoes, and we stopped upon a little cliff of granite to make him moccasins of our provision bags and slips of blanket, tying them on as firmly as we could with the extra straps and buckskin thongs. Climbing with these proved so insecure that I made Cotter go behind me knowing that under ordinary circumstances I could stop him if he fell. Here and there, in the clefts of the rocks, grew stunted pine bushes, their roots twisted so firmly into the crevices that we laid hold of them with the utmost confidence whenever they came within our reach. In this way we descended to within fifty feet of the brink, having as yet no knowledge of the cliffs below, except our general memory of their aspect from the Mount Brewer wall. The rock was so steep that we descended in a sitting posture, clinging with our hands and heels. I heard Cotter say, I think I must take off these moccasins and try it barefooted, for I don't believe I can make it. And these words were instantly followed by a startled cry, and I looked around to see him slide quickly toward me, struggling and clutching at the smooth granite, as he slid by, I made a grab for him with my right hand, catching him by the shirt and throwing myself as far in the other direction as I could, seized with my left hand a little pine tuft, which held us. I asked Cotter to edge along a little to the left 
where he could get a brace with his feet and relieve me of his weight, which he cautiously did. I then threw a couple of turns with the lasso round the roots of the pine bush, and we were safe, though hardly more than twenty feet from the brink. The pressure of curiosity to get a look over that edge was so strong within me that I lengthened out sufficient lasso to reach the end and slid slowly to the edge where, leaning over, I looked down, getting a full view of the wall for miles, directly beneath a sheer cliff of three or four hundred feet stretched down to a pile of debris which rose to unequal heights along its face, reaching the very crest not more than a hundred feet south of us. From that point to the bottom of the canyon, broken rocks, ridges rising through vast sweeps of debris, tufts of pine and frozen bodies of ice, covered the further slope. I returned to Cotter, and having loosened ourselves from the pine bush, inch by inch, crept along the granite until we supposed ourselves to be just over the top of the debris pile, where I found a firm brace for my feet and lowered Cotter to the edge. He sang out, All right, and climbed over on the uppermost debris, his head only remaining in sight of me. When I lay down upon my back, making knapsack and body do friction duty, and letting myself move, followed Cotter and reached his side. From that point, the descent required us two hours of severe, constant labor, which was monotonous of itself and would have proved excessively tiresome, but for the constant interest of glacial geology beneath us. When at last we reached bottom and found ourselves upon a velvety green meadow, beneath the shadow of wide-armed pines, we realized that the amount of muscular force we had used up and threw ourselves down for a rest of half an hour, when we rose, not quite renewed, but fresh enough to finish the day's climb. In a few minutes we stood upon the rocks just above King's River, a broad white torrent fretting its way along the bottom of an impassable gorge, Looking down the stream, we saw that our right bank was a continued precipice, affording, so far as we could see, no possible descent to the river's margin, and indeed, had we gotten down, the torrent rushed with such fury that we could not possibly have crossed it. To the south of us, a little way upstream, the river flowed out from a broad oval lake three-quarters of a mile in length, which occupied the bottom of the granite basin. Unable to cross the torrent, we must either swim the lake or climb round its head. Upon our side, the walls of the basin curved to the head of the lake in sharp, smooth precipices or broken slopes of debris, while on the opposite side, its margin was a beautiful shore of emerald meadow edged with a continuous grove of coniferous trees. Once upon this other side, we should have completed the severe part of our journey crossed the gulf, and have left all danger behind us. For the long slope of granite and ice, which rose upon the west side of the canyon and the Mount Brewer wall opposite to us, no trials save those of simple fatigue. Around the head of the lake were crags and precipices in singularly forbidding arrangement. As we turned thither, we saw no possible way of overcoming them. At its head, the lake lay in an angle of the vertical wall, sharp and straight like the corner of a room, about 300 feet in height, and for 250 feet of this, a pyramidal pile of blue ice rose from the lake, rested against the corner, and reached within 40 feet of the top. Looking into the deep blue water of the lake, I concluded that, in our exhausted state, it was madness to attempt to swim it. The only other alternative was to scale that slender pyramid of ice and find some way to climb the forty feet of smooth wall above it, a plan we chose perforce and started at once to put into execution, determined that if we were unsuccessful we would fire a dead log which lay near, warm ourselves thoroughly, and attempt the swim. At its base 
the ice mass overhung the lake like a roof under which the water had melted its way for a distance of not less than a hundred feet a thin eave overhanging the water to the very edge of this i cautiously went and looking down into the lake saw through its barrel depths the white granite blocks strewn upon the bottom at least one hundred feet below me it was exceedingly transparent and under ordinary circumstances would have been a most tempting place for a dive but at the end of our long fatigue and with the still unknown task ahead i shrunk from a swim in such a chilly temperature we found the ice angle difficultly steep but made our way successfully along its edge clambering up the crevices melted between its body and the smooth granite to a point not far from the top where the ice had considerably narrowed and rocks overhanging it encroached so closely that we were obliged to leave the edge and make our way with cut steps out upon its front streams of water dropping from the overhanging rock eaves at many points had worn circular shafts into the ice three feet in diameter and twenty feet in depth their edges offered us our only foothold and we climbed from one to another equally careful of slipping upon the slope itself or falling into the wells upon the top of the ice we found a narrow level platform upon which we stood together resting our backs in the granite corner and looked down the awful pathway of king's canyon until the rest nerved us up enough to turn our eyes upward at the forty feet of smooth granite which lay between us and safety here and there were small projections from its surface little protruding knobs of feldspar and crevices riven into its face for a few inches as we tied ourselves together i told cotter to hold himself in readiness to jump down into one of these in case i fell and started to climb up the wall succeeding quite well for about twenty feet about two feet above my hands was a crack which if my arms had been long enough to reach would have probably led me to the very top but i judged it beyond my powers and with great care descended to the side of cotter who believed that his superior length of arm would enable him to make the reach i planted myself against the rock and he started cautiously up the wall looking down the glare front of ice it was not pleasant to consider at what velocity a slip would send me to the bottom or at what angle and to what probable depth i should be projected into the ice water indeed the idea of such a sudden bath was so annoying that i lifted my eyes toward my companion he reached my farthest point without great difficulty and made a bold spring for the crack reaching it without an inch to spare and holding on wholly by his fingers he thus worked himself slowly along the crack toward the top at last getting his arms over the brink and gradually drawing his body up and out of sight it was the most splendid piece of slow gymnastics i ever witnessed for a moment he said nothing but when i asked if he was all right cheerfully repeated all right it was only a moment's work to send up the two knapsacks and barometer and receive again my end of the lasso as i tied it round my breast cotter said to me in an easy confident tone don't be afraid to bear your weight I made up my mind, however, to make that climb without his aid, and husbanded my strength as I climbed from crack to crack. I got up without difficulty to my former point, rested there a moment, hanging solely by my hands, gathered every pound of strength and atom of will for the reach, then jerked myself upward with a swing, just getting the tips of my fingers into the crack. In an instant, I had grasped it with my right hand also. I felt the sinews of my fingers relax a little, but the picture of the slope of ice and the blue lake affected me so strongly that I redoubled my grip and climbed slowly along the crack until I reached the angle and got one arm over the edge, as Cotter had done. As I rested my body upon the edge and looked up at Cotter, I saw that, instead of level top, 
he was sitting upon a smooth, roof-like slope where the least pull would have dragged him over the brink. He had no brace for his feet, nor hold for his hands, but had seated himself calmly with the rope tied round his breast, knowing that my only safety lay in being able to make the climb entirely unaided, certain that the least waver in his tone would have disheartened me, and perhaps made it impossible. The shock I received on seeing this affected me for a moment, but not enough to throw me off my guard, and I climbed quickly over the edge. When we had walked back out of danger, we sat down upon the granite for our rest. In all my experience of mountaineering, I have never known an act of such real, profound courage as this of Cotter's. It's one thing, in a moment of excitement, to make a gallant leap or hold one's nerves in the iron grasp of will, but to coolly seat oneself in the door of death and silently listen for the fatal summons, and this all for a friend, for he might have easily have cast loose the lasso and saved himself, requires as sublime a type of courage as I know. But a few steps back we found a thicket of pine overlooking our lake, by which there flowed a clear rill of snow water. Here, in the bottom of the great gulf, we made our bivouac, for we were already in the deep evening shadows, although the mountain tops to the east of us still burned in the reflected light. It was the luxury of repose which kept me awake half an hour or so, in spite of my vain attempts at sleep. To listen for the pulsating sound of waterfalls and arrowy rushing of the brook by our beds was too deep a pleasure to quickly yield up. Under the later moonlight I rose and went out upon the open rocks, allowing myself to be deeply impressed by the weird Dante-esque surroundings. Darkness, out of which to the skies towered stern, shaggy bodies of rock, snow, uncertainly moonlit with cold pallor, and at my feet the basin of the lake, still, black, and gemmed with reflected stars, like the void into which Dante looked through the bottomless gulf of Dis. A little way off there appeared upon the brink of a projecting granite cornice two dimly seen forms, pines I knew them to be, yet their motionless figures seemed bent forward, gazing down the canyon, and I allowed myself to name them Mantuan and Florentine, thinking at the same time how grand and spacious the scenery and how powerful their attitude how infinitely more profound the mystery of light and shade than any of these hard theatrical conceptions with which Doré has sought to shut in our imagination. That artist, as I believe, has reached a conspicuous failure from an overbalancing of love of solid, impenetrable darkness. There is in all his inferno landscape a certain sharp boundary between the real and unreal, and never the infinite suggestiveness of great regions of half-light in which everything may be seen, nothing recognized. Without waking Cotter, I crept back to my blankets and to sleep. The morning of our fifth and last day's tramp must have dawned cheerfully, at least so I suppose from its aspect when we first came back to consciousness, surprised to find the sun risen from the eastern mountain wall and the whole gorge flooded with its direct light. Rising as good as new from our mattress of pine twigs, we hastened to take breakfast and started up the long, broken slope of the Mount Brewer wall. To reach the pass where we had parted from our friends required seven hours of slow, laborious climbing, in which we took advantage of every outcropping spine of granite and every level expanse of ice to hasten at the top of our speed. Cotter's feet were severely cut. His tracks upon the snow were marked by stains of blood, yet he kept on with undiminished spirit, never once complaining. The perfect success of our journey so inspired us with happiness that we forgot danger and fatigue and chatted in liveliest strain. It was about two o'clock when we reached the summit 
and rested a moment to look back over our new Alps, which were hard and distinct under direct, unpoetic light. Yet with all their dense gray and white reality, their long, sculptured ranks and cold, still summits, we gave them a lingering farewell look, which was not without its deep fullness of emotion, then turned our backs and hurried down the debris slope into the rocky amphitheater at the foot of Mount Brewer, and, by five o'clock, had reached our old campground. We found here a note pinned to a tree, informing us that the party had gone down into the lower canyon five miles below, that they might camp in better pasturage. The wind had scattered the ashes of our old campfire and banished from it the last sentiment of home. We hurried on, climbing among the rocks which reached down to the crest of the great lateral moraine, and then on in rapid stride along its smooth crest, riveting our eyes upon the valley below where we knew the party must be camped. At last, faintly curling above the sea of green treetops, a few faint clouds of smoke wafted upward into the air. We saw them with a burst of strong emotion and ran down the steep flank of the moraine at the top of our speed. Our shouts were instantly answered by the three voices of our friends who welcomed us to their campfire with tremendous hugs. After we had outlined for them the experience of our days, and as we lay outstretched at our ease, warm in the blaze of the glorious campfire, Brewer said to me, King, you have relieved me of a dreadful task. For the last three days I have been composing a letter to your family, but somehow I did not get beyond. It becomes my painful duty to inform you. End of chapter 4 The Descent of Mount Tyndall